up for our now, inshallah, the, uh, you know, the, the two keynotes and the last panel of the day, inshallah, continuing on our dialogue between these various traditions. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Omar Qureshi, who is coming to us from presently Zaytuna College, although we know he's, he'd been here in Chicago for, for, for many, many years. So uh, Omar, uh, alhamdulillah, has completed a bachelor's degree at the University of Missouri, Columbia in microbiology. And he later completed a master's of education, science education, particularly in curriculum and instruction from the same institution. He was a teacher in Saudi Arabia for many years where he studied the Islamic sciences with Sheikh Laman Abu Ghudda. Um, and he also spent some time in Damascus and Syria learning with scholars such as Sheikh Hassan Darwash um, and others. He, as you know, in the Chicago community, was actually a principal and then a dean of Islamic schools here in our community, uh, Villa Park, um, and others as well. And then he recently, last year, completed a PhD in the philosophy of education and comparative education at Loyola University in Chicago, where his thesis had to do with questions of what is Islamic, how we think about Islamic education. So you can engage him on that. But we have brought him into this working group, into this scholarly tradition, because he does bridge in a sense, both science, as a science teacher, as an educator, and our religious tradition. Um, so presently, he is the assistant professor at Zaytuna College, where he teaches uh, metaphysical foundations, contemporary Muslim thought, principles of Islamic jurisprudence, and of course, he teaches on Imam al-Ghazali. So with that, inshallah, I'm going to turn over and let Professor Qureshi give us some thoughts. Alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi salam ajma'in. Rabbi shahli sadri wa sili amri wa ahlu luqdatan min nisani yafqahu qawli. Wa sallallahu ala habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I would like to begin uh, first apologizing to speaking in front of Sheikh uh, Dr. Afifi and Professor Abdullah Sassidin. I apologize for someone like me to be speaking uh, in front of you. But at least you can correct everything I'm going to say, inshallah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank also Dr. Asim Padea and the organizers of this event and all the volunteers um, for putting up with uh, all of us, I guess, in our deadlines and trying to meet them. Uh, they worked uh, the hardest, uh, mashallah. So Allah reward them all and grant them tawfiq in their future endeavors, inshallah. So um, I hope you're, uh, we're going to do some thinking, uh, br abstract thinking uh, today, inshallah. I mean, I know a lot of us, we're practitioners of our craft. And we're working in the field many times, uh, all the time, pretty much, uh, too much. Sometimes we want to go home. And uh, at the same time, uh, what, I, what we're going to do today is, uh, in, uh, in my session, inshallah, is think uh, kind of at the meta level about our craft, about our, um, and, and where does it belong in, in the wider context of our lives and uh, our reality. So uh, in particular, so when I'm using science here, I'm not speaking only of medicine. Science is much broader than medicine. Um, so I want, you know, when we're, when we're, uh, when we're reflecting, inshallah, and listening to um, what's going to be shared today, uh, don't only focus on medicine, although it includes medicine, but it's much broader than that, inshallah. So, and I'm in particularly going to be addressing the issue that impacts us all, especially in this culture, uh, of the Islam and science discourse. And looking at ways of uh, moving this discourse forward. And it's kind of, I believe, reached a, a, you know, a, a standstill. And there are reasons why I'll speak about uh, shortly, inshallah. But um, this is the main context of uh, what are ways to re you know, basically reorient this discourse, to move it forward so it can be much more um, productive for um, everybody, inshallah, uh, all, all stakeholders. So the idea of a conflict uh, between religion and science has generated a vast amount of literature that posits diverse solutions and models to the apparent conflict and how the two should interact. One such solution is the principle of non-overlapping magisteria of Stephen Jay Gould's NOMA. That's very well known and that's one solution of how to resolve the science and uh, religion conflict. A magisterium is a domain where one form of teaching holds the appropriate tools for meaningful discourse and resolution. In other words, we debate and hold dialogue under a particular magisterium. So his solution, Stephen Jay Gould's solution, is science has its role to play, and religion has its role to play, and never should the two meet. 
And so, um, and we just deal with these issues separately. That's a, uh, an approach that he's uh, suggested. Science under this model is concerned with the empirical realm, which covers fact and theory. Religion, on the other hand, covers questions of ultimate meaning and moral value. This model secures a place for both religion and science in the life of a person. Other solutions, the problem with this is that as a human being, everything comes together. We're not necessarily, this is conceptually, we're separating certain things that in reality, can you actually conceptually separate these two? This is the problem with this type of um, approach. The conflict thesis has generated discussion and responses from Muslim scientists, theologians, and philosophers as well. In the 2003 journal of, uh, appropriately, in Islam and Science, Dmitry Gutas questioned the validity of the title of the journal itself. Uh, declaring it to be a false statement. Gutas' main objection was that the title assumed the existence of an immutable Islam, that there was such an entity that, was, you can, uh, uh, that you can call Islam, that never changes. It's something that's immutable throughout the Muslim world for the past 14 centuries up until the present, insisting that Islam in Baghdad during 1800s was different from the Islam that existed during Cairo in the, uh, in, in the thousands and so on. Gutas concluded that the assumption of an immutable notion of Islam simply misleads and clouds the reality of all issues relating to science and Muslims. The issue ultimately relates to the development of a working definition of what would be called the Islamic worldview and should be pursued from that starting point. Equally important but not addressed by Gutas is the question in which, in which understanding of science lies at the core of any attempt to develop a structural relationship between Islam and science. In responding to Gutas, Muzaffar Iqbal, who is also the editor of the journal, attempts to answer the question, is there anything that can be called normative Islam? So he's trying to answer this important question. Um, we'll come back to this shortly. So this is a question that he's asking here, is, that is there anything that, uh, that can be called normative Islam? In the affirmative, he states, yes. And uh, when discussing issues relating to Islam, and, uh, and science. Iqbal states that normative Islam is neither a historic construct nor a social contract. It is a metaphysical, metahistorical construct which Islam shares with other monotheistic religions. Briefly stated, this essential Islam is none other than the first part of the Shahada, which every Muslim proclaims numerous times during the course of his or her day, La ilaha illallah, there is no deity other than Allah. So, in addition, so this is his uh, solution because this is the question now that scholars are discussing in this Islam and science debate. Is there even such a thing as Islam <laughs> that we can you know, grasp onto that's common to all Muslims and, and, um, and in order for us to carry on this discussion of Islam and science? So Muzaffar Iqbal's answer is, uh, as you can see uh, over there, yes there is and what captures it is the Shahada. In addition to this, there exists a set of beliefs about God and the human form uh, uh, and the human that form the essence of Islam. Not addressing various questions <coughs> this understanding of normative Islam generates for the purposes of understanding the nature of relationship between Islam and science. This understanding ultimately, I want to argue, is not adequate for the simple reason that it's too general. Right? To say this is all Islam is, it's too general to serve as a framework to explore the area where we believe true tensions exist between certain conceptions of Islam and science. Our proposal is that the conversations on Islam and science should be conducted at the philosophical and metaphysical levels. And the reason why we're making this claim has to do with the relationship of what we call uh, every science that we uh, undertake or that we, uh, we endeavor in. It presumes a metaphysical framework. And this is something, this is basically in, uh, the argument that, uh, one of the premises of the argument that I would like to propose today. E.J. Lau, who's actually a, a secular philosopher, he passed away um, relatively recently. His, in his introduction to philosophy of mind, his work on that, he says metaphysics. Now what is metaphysics? These are big words, but nothing to be afraid of really. Uh, which has traditionally been held to be the root of all philosophy is a systematic investigation of the most fundamental structure of reality. So take a statement that was mentioned today in one of the pre presentations um, prior by uh, Mufti Kamaluddin, not to single him out, 
But uh, he, so he, if he, if when he mentioned the statement that the soul is immaterial, this is a valid statement to make, but you are assuming that immaterial objects exist. You're taking that for granted. What metaphysics does is to say, do metaphysical, do immaterial objects exist first? So we first, so there's an assumption being made when you state the soul is an immaterial object because many individuals in our time, most notably modern scientists, will hold that immaterial objects do not exist. Now this is not, this is a metaphysical question that both scientists and religious scholars need to understand. And so uh, when a person states, so when we look at our statements, we really have to look at what are we uh, assuming, what's, what are we taking as given. So in a statement, whether you st whatever position you take, is the soul material, is it a subtle body, or is the soul an Im immaterial um, a substance? Well, you're assuming substances exist, and we're going to so show uh, shortly that many people believe substances do not actually exist. All that exists in a chair, for example, is just a random combination of arbitrary accidents. These are all metaphysical questions that um, all of our crafts, all of our crafts, now, whether you're in education, whether you're in science, whether you're in the field of medicine, whether you're in law, you name it, presupposes these metaphysical commitments, metaphysical um, presuppositions that inform our, our craft. So Lao says, and this is an important claim he makes, and uh, Imam Ghazali would say the same thing here, and, but he, the term he will use is al ilm al-kulli, which is a universal science. And he identifies that universal science, which uh, functions in the same way is, uh, as uh, ilm al-kalam, which he defines the subject matter of ilm al-kalam as al-mawjood min haythu hu al-mawjood, which is the existent qua existent. That's what the subject matter and its studies here. So Lao says that no special science, not even physics, much less psychology, can usurp the role of metaphysics. Um, because every empirical science presupposes a metaf uh, metaphysical framework in which to interpret its experimental findings. So I remember uh, here at Loyola in my grad's class, is, uh, where it was a class on existentialism, and we were reading the work of Hannah Arendt, who's an incredible philosopher. And uh, we're, we're talking about modern science in one of her chapters in the book, The Human Condition, and what she said after reading this book, we were all discussing it in our seminar. And of course, you know, uh, it's just a bunch of philosophers, no scientists there. But the conclusion, you know, of everybody in the room was that every science department, needs to have a little office, or it could be a big one, on their floor, departmental floor, and that should be reserved for a philosopher. Why? Because that person, he or she, should, every scientist, as they conduct their research, I don't know if there's a room for a philosopher on this floor here, but it can take it as a suggestion, they could, uh, they can just, as they're conducting their research, they meet with that philosopher and speak with them and sh bounce their ideas off, and they'll ask them questions of this nature to make sure their findings are coherent and consistent, and um, they're aware of the activities that they're taking on. Now, they could have just been saying that because they all wanted jobs afterwards. You know, that's a possibility. But nonetheless, the point, I think, is pretty valid um, in our case, too. I think as a Muslim, we would agree with that. So what are some examples in modern science regarding um, some of the metaphysical statements? And this is when we use the word science, this is why we have to be very careful. And we don't make these nuances. I think in our type of context, we cannot afford, I mean, if we, uh, the not making any uh, nuances and distinctions is to our own peril as we conduct all of our research. And so making nuances is of the essence here. And it will give us clarity and it will increase our, gra our um, granularity as we look at and resolution as we look at all of our issues. So you have in, in science, you actually have the empiricist and the, um, uh, you have the, uh, the empiricist and the realist epistemologies in science. So when you say science, you actually have to ask a question, which, which science are you referring to? You simply cannot just say science anymore, unless you intend by it empirical fact or empirical data, that's fine. But when we talk about science as an enterprise, as an endeavor for how to understand reality, we can't just let it go. And, uh, and the reasons that hopefully we'll show as we uh, continue here. Empiricist and realist epistemologies of, sci of scientists bring to the fore central, a central metaphysical concern about the truth claims of science. The empiricist camp in, in modern science, uh, which holds that n knowledge is to be found only in the domain of experience and, uh, and the observable, is directly at odds with the realist camp, 
whose adherents use sense data to postulate over the unobservable aspects of reality. People like Osiander Berkeley Bohr can be considered to ally with the empiricist perspective, whereas Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and Einstein align with the realist perspective of science. So, we, okay, if they're a realist or they're empiricist, when we read Einstein's work, we need to keep that in mind, right, as he analyzes uh, and, per, and, and we study him. The fundamental distinction is that empiricists wish to confine claims to, of science to what we experience. In other words, for an empiricist, if I were to want to make a scientific analysis of this chair in front of me, right, to me, what all I'm really doing is analyzing the concept of the chair in my mind. I'm not, am I ref are my statements referring to the reality of this chair as it exists? They'll say no. Now, so all my theories, all of my uh, predictions, all of my analysis as a scientist, it's, it's not about the chair as it is in reality, it's about the chair as it exists in our mind, kind of like the Kantian notion of the phenomena and the noumena. So it's, it's the world of phenomena where um, all of us exist. And, and that's all we can know is what really exists in our mind. We can't know and experience the chair as it is. And that's the world of uh, noumena. So this is important. So this, this is a very important issue that separates um, the, the two schools in science. So what are some of the consequences? Well, if you take Newton's law of gravitational attraction, which explains the planetary motions described by Kepler, that, that's actually a good example of realist theori uh, uh, theorization building upon empirical claims. Yet the realist goes beyond just empirical observation, seeking to explain uh, phenomena at a deeper, yet more generalizable level. For example, according to Newton, force, right, when we talk about force, is not just a mathematical construct, right, for explaining motions of a body. Rather, force is real. You see, and this is important distinction to make. Are we talking about something that actually, when we say force, first of all, are we observing force or not? That's the question, but it's a concept that's widely used. And so, oh boy. Uh, so force is real, although di uh, not directly observable, and acts upon an object, making the object accelerate or turn direction. So I will, in the sake, for the sake of time here, I will go on and um, to the second part. So this first part is basically stating um, the whole argument that I would like to make here is that whenever we ask about science, whenever we talk about Islam in particular as well, we have to ask uh, the, the argument uh, and, and the, the way the conversation is taking place now, it's at a very general level. It's almost like, you know, just, okay, you believe in God, we're a bunch of theists, okay, we can get you know, we have uh, all religions really will, will have something in common in our religions, yet we know that's not the case. Our religions aren't the same in terms of their commitments and what they believe and their practices and their histories. So the argument that I would like to uh, make is that we need to get a level deeper in order to move this conversation further, and we need to speak from particular schools. So when we say Islam, well, what's, what are we, are we speaking of, uh, of the Ashari school of theology? Are we speaking of a particular school of law, and we can't even speak in grammar, we have schools. And so why are we seeming to ignore these distinctions um, when it comes to this question of science? And even in science, we have schools of science as well. And so we need to really get to that level of discourse. Then we can start dealing with issues like causation. We can start dealing with issues like substances. Do they really exist? Do they not exist? Many people will, and, and according to logical positivists, um, Bertrand Russell is a very uh, a clear example of this. Um, maybe we can get to this slide here really quick. For, for Bertrand Russell, um, he's a very important and uh, influential individual on, in modern science. He takes the statement, Socrates is a man, and he compares this to a statement, all Greeks are men. And what he would say here is that the statement, Socrates is a man, it's about a particular individual that has what he calls existential, um, uh, uh, it has existential import, meaning that you're actually speaking about something that really exists. Whereas a statement, all Greeks are men, you're not actually talking about something that exists. Where do Greeks, the category, class of Greeks, exist in reality? And so he would actually state, and this is contrary to 
what Aristotle uh, held. So, for example, when you say every x is y, there's no existential import to this statement for Bertrand Russell. Yet, for Aristotle, uh, every x, the proposition every x is y has existential import. You're actually, when you say all tables or all chairs are, you know, bodies, for example, you are actually speaking about something that exists in reality. Yet modern science, because it dropped away with the Aristotelian metaphysics, which informs pre-modern science, is, uh, is, is, is highly informed by this positivism that exists. So much of your research, whether you recognize it or not, is actually conducted in a positivist framework. Now the problem with this is that um, when you look at it philosophically, and you look at what type of generalizations or how you view this metaphysically, your own research, you're going to realize that, like, for example, Muslim scholars, when you look at Muslim works in logic, they will hold that all, so uh, this is a typical book in, like an intermediate book uh, in logic will have what's called the square of oppositions. Anybody who studied logic here will, will be very familiar. Actually, everybody who studied uh, uh, Aristotelian logic will be familiar with this. Modern logic, they will never, you won't see this in a modern logic textbook. Why? Because they come from a positivist, that's logic un being undertaken in a, positivist uh, framework, whereas you'll only find this in works that have an Aristotelian understanding um, uh, behind their works. So you usually see this in Muslim books, you see this in the Catholic tradition, you see this in the Jewish tradition as well. And so for Bertrand Russell basically, what he would state is these two statements, these universal, uh, these A and E statements, right, that all P's are Q's or no P's are Q's, they tell us nothing about reality. They're kind of X'd out. Science doesn't deal with them. Science, uh, scientists, according to the Bertrand Russell School, will only say these uh, statements, propositions that deal with particulars, some P's are Q's or no, uh, some P's are not Q's. These are the only one statements, propositions that have existential import. Very, very important, right? I mean, scientists, do you make a generalization or not based on your data? And if you are making a generalization, are you making the claim that this is actually a generalization about something that exists in reality? Are you speaking about the nature of water itself? Are you, doing, uh, are you making a hookum on that? Or are you speaking about the nature? When we talk about the human being, where are all these things such an, an essence of human being? Where does it exist? Is it only in the mind? Or when we talk about the human being, are we actually making a, a claim about something that exists outside in external reality? So I'll uh, move on to emerging in the main argument, which is engaging science from a theological school. This is my recommendation on how to move forward in this conversation. And if we look at the case of, there's two individuals I would like to look at. One is the case of um, Alauddin, his name is Ibn al-Nafis, a very, very interesting figure in Islamic history. And um, he, was, uh, he passed away in the year 1288. He was a Shafi'i jurist. And it's important to pay attention to all these things that I'm going to mention because it's, it's, uh, it, it relates to our, the conversation we'll have towards the end. He was a Shafi'i jurist. He was an Ash'ari theologian. He was a Hadith scholar as well. And um, so some of the works he's written is Al-Mukhtasr fi, um, fi, uh, fi Ilm al-Usul al-Hadith, which is um, a very interesting work. Um, some scholars, uh, such as uh, Dr. Sharif Hatam al-Auni, he actually said that this, re this, this text that he wrote represents a significant development in the science of hadith um, because the way he arranged books on Mustala hadith and it's normally associated with Ibn Hajar Asqalani and who's Nuzat another, but Ibn Nafis is prior to him, right? And so the reason why I'm mentioning this is not to get in the conversation on hadith, but to show that he actually, he's, he made a significant contribution to these various sciences that he was an expert in. Um, what is interesting to note that the corpus of Ibn Nafis is that it contains works, he composed significant works on philosophical theology and over 30 works on anatomy, medicine, and physiology as well. He has an interesting work at Risal al-Kamaliya, Fi Sirat al-Nabawiyah. He's responding to um, Ibn Tufail, who was an Abyssinian uh, Andalusian um, philosopher. His book, Hayy ibn Yaqzan, that's probably what we, we are familiar with, but there's actually a Sunni def response to Hay ibn Yaqzan, um, Ibn Tufail's work, and Ibn Nafis wrote that work. And it's a very intricate, very, uh, you know, um, you know uh, s a philosophical response to Ibn Tufail and, the, and, and dealing with um, reason and what reason can provide us in terms of the truth and revelation and its relationship between the two. 
So his works in medicine, though, are very interesting. Al Mujas Fitlib is one of his more um, well known works in, um, in, in medicine. And so, uh, and this is considered, it actually, it actually gained such prominence, it became known as the Dustul al Atibba. This was the the major, you know, you find the physician's desk reference. This is that book. That's, that's how it functioned in Muslim society. And he also has a Shur Qanun of, uh, as you heard today, of Ibn Sina. Now, some of the things that he contributed was that he proposed a new physiology which was in direct opposition to the physiology of Aristotle, Galen, and Ibn Sina. Most Western historians of science are very familiar with Ibn Nafis's work. And um, so they, and but he wasn't just, you know, the, the point I want to make here is that he wasn't just known as a person who read some books or studied hadith. He was an actual, uh, uh, I mean, he, he, he developed the science and produced works that developed the science in Ashari theology as well. And also we see this in, the, um, uh, in, in medicine in particular. This led to a new theory of, uh, of uh, embryogenesis and a new understanding of pulse and his, and his proposal of the pulmonary transit of blood is deeply rooted, as, as uh, a lot of scholars have said, in the epistemological, theological, and physiological issues of his time. He developed a theory, uh, a theory of highly morphic um, psychology. One of his claims, usually you read in the books of theology, that what's the relationship of the soul to the body, and they'll usually identify an organ when they're trying to look. And some will say different organs. Most Ashari scholars say it's the heart, the physical heart. It's not located there, but that's the ta'alluq. That's the that's the locus of where there's a relationship between the soul and the body. Ibn Nafis is claiming uh, opposite, uh, not opposite, he's claiming something different, which is that the soul has a connection with the entire body, right? That's the ta'aluk. It's not really with a particular um, organ of the body. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is to show that he is, uh, this is a person who's engaging in science. He's developing new theories. He's going against prevailing theories of science uh, in his time. And he's a theologian, and he's a Hadith scholar, and he's, and he's working from his theological school and his epistemological commitments to engage in scientific um, work and scientific development. And um, so I know we're running out of time, but the other individual I wanted to look at was Aduddin al-Iji, who is one of the greatest, if anybody studied works in, in Ashari theology, they'll know he's one of the, uh, his book is, he is the authority of the later Ashari scholars in his work, Shah al-Mu'aqif, and how he deals with science as well. I can share that if, if you would like. Um, continue? Oh, okay, we'll continue, inshallah, then. Thank you. Um, so, the work of um, Abdul Hamid Sabra, uh, Sabra he, he passed away recently too, relatively recently, yeah. He did a really wonderful study of al and looked at his engagement uh, with many positions of scientists. And some of the conclusions of his work I want to share with you, because I think it's informative for us on how to engage science, again, from a theological school. All of our scientists, um, all of our theologians, whenever they engage science, it was from a particular theological school, and that's the argument I want to claim, is that that's how we as Muslims should be um, uh, engaging science. So. Now. So one of the things that we see is that um, in his work on Mu'aqif, the uh, when we notice is how El Iji engages the um, polemic, sorry, the uh, Ptolemaic picture of the world. In his work on Mu'aqif, he states he, he gives a very accurate summary of the Ptolemaic um, understanding of the world astronomically, and then what he says here is that um, he so he's talking about the the spherical bodies. And he's looking at the number that's been um, recognized up until that time. And he says they add up to 24. And, and then he goes through the various classifications of the spherical bodies and the orbs. Now, he doesn't contest the numbers. His point, when we look at his, uh, his argument here and his presentation, <coughs> he's not contesting the empirical finding itself, that point of data, that there's 24 orbs and, then, and what their classifications are. In fact, what he says here is that the number is not contested by E.G. Rather, what he contests is the relative uh, distance that between Venus and the sun in one of the uh, issues that he brings up. And he says, why is he contesting this? He says, because this was based, the position of a lot of astronomers, this was based on the premise that the body of the heavens is incapable of being perished. Again, this is a metaphysical uh, uh, claim. 
Otherwise, it would be possible to attribute the planet's movement to the planet itself as a swimmer is in water. So they were studying the orbits of the, of the, of the planets. <coughs> El Eiji questions this reasoning, stating, why not allow the planets to be placed in rings rather than complete spheres or spherical shells, which would move either by themselves or by, an, an, uh, uh, or by an, a force, an impulsion exerted on by the planets. Subra's conclusion here, and this is what he states, is that he states that Subra's concludes, uh, actually let me get to this one paragraph first, that we see here that the Ashadid atomism continued to hold sway during the age of science uh, in the Islamic civilization and was the locus of dialogue between theologians and philosophers come scientists and indeed remains part of the library of the Islamic intellectual tradition which may one day be recovered and built upon better to explain the realities around us. And here's what Sabra finally concludes, uh, that uh, he concludes remarking on the relationship between Ash'ari Kalam and, uh, and theology and science, stating, science was not the direct competitor of Kalam in the way that falsafa was. And generally, the specified specialized scientific disciplines were not as such perceived as posing a threat to religion. And so what was the issue? And yet, despite it wasn't seen as a threat, still, there's still some work to do with these scientific um, uh, deliverables. And yet, they had to be reinterpreted in light of the prevailing Kalam metaphysics and given new foundations and new definitions of their scope and value. This was the approach of um, of uh, Ashari theologians and dealing with science. Can I have one more slide or it'll conclude inshallah. I'm a bad guest, so I'm asking for more food. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to end basically in in, in some practical um, you know uh, some some practical observations. And this is really interesting by Mufti Taqi Osmani, who he said in his he has a work on ishtihad. And he's talking about al ishtihad al matlu fi asrina. What what type of ishtihad? It's not he's not even actually it's beautiful because he's not saying should we do ishtihad or not. He's saying no, <laughs> ishtihad is a given. His, his question is what type of ishtihad should we be doing? And what he says is the following. And he's speaking about this importance of expertise. And I think this is really good advice. And but we can build off of what he's saying here. So he says here is that. Um, so Mufti Taki Usmani says uh, uh, on the nature of ishtihad in our times, in light of the growth of knowledge uh, in, in the various sciences, he says that it is necessary for the collective body undertaking the matter of ishtihad today to intimately know, so this is something that a mushtahid should know, someone who's conducting ishtihad, know the living conditions, economy, trade, occupations, law, politics, and contemporary customs of daily life. This is because legal rulings regarding many transactions today is contingent upon this knowledge. However, this intimate knowledge that a jurist has to have and possess, right, this intimate knowledge is not completely acquired by religious scholars and jurists by themselves. And this is the case for two reasons. In other words, is Ibn Nafis our model for today? Can we find someone who is master in theology, master in, in uh, jurisprudence, master in hadith, someone who is ma master in science and the practice of medicine. In light of the growth of knowledge that we've seen since Ibn Nafis's time to ours, especially in the natural sciences, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's not really the model that we're, we should be advocating. Rather, the model that we're advocating is the one Mufti Taki Osmani is going to explain here. And he says, for two reasons, he's going to say, this is not an individual project. It has to be a collective effort. Why? Colonialism in Islamic lands has created a gulf between religion and the world, as well as between the two educational systems, leaving one aiming at preserving the sciences of the Quran and Sunnah with no relation to secular sciences. He used the word secular, I, I, I would, while the other aiming at, at acquiring the secular sciences with no relationship to religion. One who graduates from this last educational system, regardless of the extent of his knowledge of the secular sciences, severs his relation with the religious sciences. Similarly, one who graduates from the first system, meaning the, uh, the Madadis, has not completed his knowledge of the present world, regardless of his extent of knowledge of the Quran, Sunnah, the legal sciences, and their, uh, and their ancillary disciplines. That's one reason, the effect of colonialism. We have to account for that, and he does a really good job by doing that. The last and second reason he gives is 
he states that the scope of every science has widened as the number of subdivisions and specializations has increased. One person cannot encompass all dimensions of the sciences. Consequently, he describes our time as our time is an era, era of specializations. Every division of science has a specialist. Therefore, we should not have the expectation from an expert in the religious sciences, regardless of how high his or her achievements in the science and God-fearing myth of Tukla, to be distinguished in all sciences simultaneously, having reached the level of ishtihad in the sciences of the Quran, while being an authority and an expert in all secular sciences. And so with this, we can see that the collective, uh, the, the, the method of working as well. Now, this group represents physicians primarily and jurists. If we're going to take into consideration metaphysical issues, we need to bring in scientists and philosophers and theologians and also jurors. We need to expand kind of the, the, uh, the participants of this conversation in here. There's a lot more to say. I apologize. Um,